Well, I want to welcome you to our Tuesday Bible study. We're in the season of Advent. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for your blessings. Pray you be with us in the season of blue, the season of hopefulness, that we might be prepared to meet you once again. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, today, this season of Advent, we are again in the season of blue. It's a, season, a color of hopefulness. I'm wearing some blue, and oh, by the way, you notice my shirt. You may not be able to see that. It says, let it snow. We are getting our first snowfall of the year today. It may actually wipe out our actual in-person Tuesday service. So many of you might be watching online tonight since you can't get here to the church. That's all good. We'll be here next week. Come back when it's safe. As always, your safety, your health is the most important thing. Well, listen, let's take a look at the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, 1 to 9. And I hope it's... Uh, you know, it's one of the, the, the lessons that we read <clears throat> from the Old Testament related to our hope in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't necessarily believe that this passage directly has anything to do with a prediction or a prophecy about Jesus. As you will see as I read it momentarily, it's more setting the stage for the season of Advent, the same type of emotions that the people of Israel had at the time that this book was written are the same type of emotions we have as we anticipate the coming of the Messiah, the hope that we have there, because we need some hope today. You will see that today's lesson is really very contemporary in how it is meant to be understood and interpreted. It is really meant for us today. And so let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down, make your name known to your enemies, and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down. The mountain trembled before you. Since ancient times no one has heard, nor ear has perceived, nor eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right. You remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against uh, them, you're angry. How then could we ever be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous acts are like rags, filthy rags. We are shriveled up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay a hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are your clay, you are the potter, we are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Look on us, we pray, for we are your people. So you see, this is a prayer. It's not a prediction, a prophecy about something to take place in the future. Sometimes we find that to be true in the book of Isaiah. But in this case, it is a prayer of people who have lost hope, but are looking up and hoping that God will provide an answer to their hopeless situation. Well, let's first of all figure out what their hopeless situation is at that time, and then we will discover how God wants to address our seemingly hopeless situation today. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is that I believe, and I've accepted what many academic and biblical scholars tell us, that this was written in what's called the post-exilic period of the nation of Israel's history. Now, um, before we get there, I want you to remember when we looked at the book of Isaiah last year, many scholars, most biblical scholars, believe that Isaiah is a book that was written in at least three parts, if not more. First of all, chapters 1 to 39, which that would have taken place somewhere between 720 and 680 B.C. Okay? And this would have been the original Isaiah. Um, now, I say that with some fear and trepidation because people assume that 
when I'm going to make this next statement that I think the Bible in the book of Isaiah was written in three parts. Oh, you must be one of those liberals. No, I'm not one of those liberals. I just look at the evidence what the Bible uh, presents to us, uh, li the literary style, the context of it, and it makes more sense that this is a book written in three parts. It doesn't take away from the prophecy of the book. It doesn't take away from it being the Word of God in any way. There's no reason why we can't use our brains when we think about the Bible. So we have this very first section, 1 to 39. We believe that the second section, verse, chapters 40 to 55, whoops, chapters 40 to 55 were written around 580 B.C., give or take. This was at the time of the Babylonian captivity when they had been destroyed by the nation of Babylon, the, the southern tribes, because already the northern tribes were gone. This is when the northern tribes were being destroyed and the southern tribes were all that was left. The southern tribe was finally destroyed. They were taken into captivity. We believe the chapter that we're looking at today was written in that last section. Chapters 55 to 66. What was that time frame? Or after 539 B.C. The post-exilic time. So what happened is Persia, who again, I always make reference to that movie because it's the one pop cultural reference that most people understand. The movie 300 with Gerard Butler. Uh, and we remember that movie. And it was really, if you're a Jew, you're not on the side of the Greeks. Because the Persians were the good guys. Remember, if you're a Jew, the Persians are the good guys. The Persians came and they destroyed Babylon. And they kept a very aggressive country, Greek, at bay. Now, we romanticize Greek, but let's face it. Greek conquered most of the known world. All the way to Afghanistan. So they were not a nice people. They put them under their thumb. But the Persians freed these folks. They freed the Jews. They allowed them a great deal of autonomy. So they liked the Persians, all right? So the Persians came and delivered them from captivity and released them to go back to their nation and rebuild it. So we are in the rebuilding phase after that great exile in Babylon. Now, as I said, this is not a liberal position or biblical scholarship position. There's no reason to defend the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah as though it had to be written by one guy by the name of Isaiah. It was very common. In fact, I can prove to you that the Bible often demonstrates to us that often you would have an eponymous figure after whom a whole nation would be named or a whole history would be named, or a whole school would be named, and we don't blink an eye. Hmm, let me see, who would be one? Jacob is a good example where we see this happening all the time, and I don't notice anybody uh, anybody accusing me of being a liberal scholar because I think when the Bible refers to the nation of Israel as Jacob, oh, well, Jacob must have really been alive then. No, that's silly. So, you know, many, some of you might be confused. So let me back up just a minute. Jacob, the heel grasper, he was born and he grasped the heel uh, of his brother so that he could be born, Esau, so he could be born first and be the firstborn son and get the, uh, the inheritance of his father. Okay, so that's kind of the story, the mythology behind it. At some point, he wrestled with God and God renamed him Israel. He therefore became the eponymous ancestor of the nation of Israel. So oftentimes when you read the Bible, when it refers to the nation of Israel, we sometimes in a poetic way call it Jacob. Now this would be five, six hundred years after the death of Jacob. Well, we don't think that Jacob was still alive, do we? That would be stupid. He was dead. He was gone. But the nation of Israel is named after him. The same thing is true with Isaiah. This is not a liberal position. It's just looking at the evidence of the Bible and what it presents to us. Now, it is true that it was one scroll by the time, that, uh, the time of Jesus. That's absolutely true. Or by the 2nd century B.C. is probably when these books were collected together. But 
Remember, the book of Isaiah was completed 500 years before the oldest copies of the books of the Bible that we have uh, were written. Okay? So, we don't know how this book actually came. We are just looking at the literary evidence, and this is what we are deducing, that there are three different sections to the book. Again, it was a school of Isaiah. There was an original Isaiah here, and this is his school that continued through the eponymous school of Isaiah that continued to prophesy as, again, uh, we see with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah started the school of prophecy of Elijah, and so they were all known by Elijah, even after Elijah was taken up into the clouds to be in heaven. So there you go. I just want to make sure we clarify that in case anybody's really distressed by this. But this is the time frame that we think, the context of the chapter that we are reading, the post-exilic time. So what was going on in the post-exilic time? So the nation of Israel, who by this time had already transformed their theology, we had always, or the Jews had always thought of themselves as connected to the land of Israel. But now here they were no longer in the land of Israel, so they no longer were people of the land, but people of the book. The Bible took on a significance. When I say the Bible, we're talking about what we call the Pentateuch. Okay? Genesis, Exodus, Vegas, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was their Bible at this point. But this took on a significance to them that they wanted to pass this on to future generations. They became known as people devoted to this book. Okay? They realized that the promise of the land was conditional. It wasn't one of those, I promise to love you forever. Okay, when you get married, I promise to love you forever. When God loves us, I promise to love you forever. The land was not promised to them forever. It was conditioned upon their behavior. And it was removed from them. Okay? They lost it. So they thought they would never return to the land again. So they became devoted to this book. So here they are in a very peculiar situation. They're back in the land. How do you make sense of this theologically when you've already bypassed that way of thinking that your people, your tribe, is associated with a particular plot of land in Canaan? Well, this is what they're struggling with. Oh, that's not all. They're under attack because all types of tribes who were living there before don't like the fact that the Jews are coming back to reoccupy the land. Hmm, that sounds actually very contemporary too, doesn't it? When Israel resettled in 1948 back in the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, a lot of the surrounding countries didn't appreciate that very much. They get a little bit testy about that. They're like, we've been here for a thousand years. And in some cases, some of the people who, uh, who had lived in the land of Canaan, what we now call Israel, had lived there for 1,500 years, longer than the Jews had ever lived there. So, it's no reason why they were a little upset by the return of the Jews in 1948. The same thing is playing, being played out here. They're a little upset. They're being thrust back into the country that they abandoned years and years ago because of the exile, and the Babylonians put them there, and so a lot of people are attacking them. So they're trying to build the walls, they're trying to build the temple, all while they are under attack. And if you're interested in any of that, there's actually two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. That are written about the same time frame. And uh, this person in particular is the prophet, the man who's in charge of the rebuild of the walls in the temple. And they're sitting here with a sword in one hand while they're, meanwhile, lifting up bricks to build a wall. And it's kind of an interesting story, and I encourage you if you get the opportunity to read that. But this is the context. So it's really an explosive context. What are they supposed to do? And here they are under attack. They're in a land they never thought they'd return to. 
what does it mean now to have a relationship with God? So, within that context, we have this writing, this plea to God, please be merciful to us, God. We know you, we've offended you. Verse 3, let me read this. God, you did awesome things, things that we did not expect. We didn't expect you to let us resettle back here again. Every time the Jews turn around, God is doing something amazing and unexpected, but that's what grace and love does, doesn't it? And so here's what I find amazing. Look at verse 5. You came, oh no, let me, let me read verse 4 too, because this is really important. Since ancient times no one's heard, no ear is perceived, no eye is seen, any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. This is, I, I know I keep hammering this, but this is really important. Because this is the context of the Bible. I make reference to these because Baal is mentioned quite often in the Bible. Actually, there are many uh, scholars, myth mythology scholars, who believe that Zeus is an outgrowth of Baal. Okay? And so there's a similarity to that. And El, you know, when we talk about God, uh, the God of the nation of Israel shares an awful lot in common here too. So there's some thought process that unites these. But Baal lives on top of where again? Mount Carmel. Zeus lives where again? On top of Mount Olympus. Do they ever come down to help their people? Are you kidding me? The only time Zeus gets his rear end off the Mount Olympus is to go chase after a woman and get her pregnant. I, I'm serious. That is the only thing that gets Zeus off of his throne in Olympus, is he sees a beautiful woman, he says, I want to have sex with that woman. <laughs> and he will pursue them and pursue them. In fact, many of the Greek mythologies and stories are all about the great lengths that Zeus goes to in order to have sex with women. Crazy! That's the only reason why he comes off of Mount Olympus. He doesn't give a rip about you. He doesn't care about me. Neither does Baal. They're up there in their temples. But our God leaves the security of his temple, his heavenly temple, and comes to be with us. You who come to help those who do what's right, who remember your ways, but we have continued to sin against you. You are angry with us. How then could we ever be saved? Well, if you're dependent on Baal, forget it. Dependent on Zeus, forget it. But if you depend on this God, this God leaves his throne in the heavenly kingdom to come down and be with us. Huh. Now, I did mention to you that I think this is not a prophecy about Jesus. However, this in of itself does reflect a theology that is common throughout the Bible. Our God gets his hands dirty. Our God resides amongst us. Genesis 1, seventh day. God resided amongst us. The tabernacle in the wilderness, God resided amongst his people. The temple in Israel, God resided with his people. Oh, and then we get John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word God tabernacle dwelt amongst us. So when you see in John 1 the word God dwelt amongst us, it is the same word as resides. Tabernacle. Tabernacle in the wilderness. God tabernacled amongst us in Jesus Christ. God comes down off of his throne to be with you and me. 
because that's the only way sin can be overcome. We're broken in our relationship with God. Oh, you know, here's... God could go up here. Hey, you people down there, I forgive you, go about your business. See, this is what Zeus does, and this is what Baal does. No, that's not what, that's not what this God does. This God says, understands that we are Missouri. We're the show me state, right? We have to see it, touch it, believe it, to feel it, to know it, to understand it. So this God says, I'm coming down there. Not to get you straight, but to reconnect with you and have relationship with you. That's what this passage is talking about. How spectacular is that? That's amazing. Look at verse 9. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Oh. Do not remember our sin forever. Look on us, we pray. For we are your people. Oh, we are on the other side of John 1. God did look upon his people and was kind and merciful and gracious to us. God is not angry with you. God is not angry with me. Okay? God is kind and has remembered us in Jesus Christ. God has come down off of his mountaintop to dwell amongst us. And so I'm telling you, I, 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 if you're listening to any preachers I, that are sitting here and saying, COVID-19 is the judgment of God, please turn them off. It's one of those things that just happens in a world filled with seven and a half, eight billion people. We are in such close proximity that sometimes these things happen and, and, and these things get passed. But God has demonstrated his love and care for us by dwelling amongst us in this time, in this season. God has provided us with brains and people with brilliance who he's given an answer to, who created uh, and. and is, are creating a shot that we can receive to protect us from this and from one another. He's given us people who care that are providing food. Maybe you're one of the ones providing food. You're God's work and hands and activity in this world. You're God coming down into this world by offering food to those who don't have it. God has given us everything we need to care for each other. So this is all bold. This idea that God somehow is standing in judgment of this world. No, God loves this world. has provided us everything that we need to overcome this really difficult season. That tells me that God is not done with us yet. And it's not abandoned us. God has come down off of his lofty mountaintop to be in our presence. Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for coming off of your mountaintop to be with us. You have been kind and generous and merciful. This is a very contemporary lesson. This is this, this written uh, 2,500 years ago, for goodness sakes. It applied to Jesus. God coming off the mountaintop to dwell amongst us. It applies to today. In an age of COVID-19, God has come off his mountaintop to dwell amongst us. You do not hold our sin against us. You forgive us. You want relationship with us. And we just give you thanks for the, these things. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and be safe tonight. Come back next week for those who want to be here in person. Love to see you. But your safety is the most important of all. Blessings to you tonight.